Okay, well, today's discussion is about another one of your articles, which is, um, what was it called? About building back better, no, building back later. It's based on this this um, slogan, building back better, but you've retitled it building back better. So it's about uh, government policies and about the, the, the mess we're in, particularly um, because of the growth of unemployment and the projected growth of unemployment and um, so you, you you start your article um, basically saying that we can anticipate that government will or is already planning infrastructural projects and job creation projects and um, throwing money at particularly unemployment through these and um, you don't, well, this is a question really, you don't have an objection to the idea of infrastructure and job creation projects per se as such, um, but you've got a particular criticisms of, um, the, well, you, you actually attack the ideas of um, the World Economic Forum but as, as it happens, the UK government does have um, draft infrastructure plans and it does, I don't know about job creation programs, but anyway, can you, can you launch off about, about what it is about the World Economic Forum and, and maybe what it is about the, um, the UK government's plans that you're, you differ with? Yeah, I... If you like, the one thing that sort of Western governments generally dislike doing is directing money directly at people. So the way out of recession has traditionally been that you invest in infrastructure projects. And this goes back to FDR and the Tennessee Valley dams and building electro hydroelectric power. Uh, the, the thinking is that you invest in these projects that provides work so the government, if you like, becomes the employer of last resort. Uh, the thinking is then that as the people that get those jobs go out and spend their money, that increases demand across the wider economy, the private sector then begins to invest in job creation and the cycle restarts. Uh, so it is more likely that government will look to solve the current problems through infrastructure projects of which it will have, you know, I mean, several files full of proposals, uh, which will almost be off the, off the shelf, um, you know, a bypass here, a new railway there. What it does, uh, it has a national infrastructure strategy, I, I just, in preparation, I went and looked, so. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there will be all kinds of things. Now, the point with those is they are likely to be backward looking. So they will be addressing, actually, probably the world before 2080, because the expectation has been since 2008 that we're somehow going to get back to normal. It's just a matter of time. Because the problem in a way is we haven't got back to normal. Um, we've seen the prosperity of an ever greater part of the population disappearing. Uh, I mean, if you're fortunate enough to be roughly in the top 20% of wage earners or salary earners in the UK, you've still seen some prosperity. But for roughly 80%, you've either stagnated or you've seen your living standards go down. The problem then is, well, in that climate, should you be looking to invest in the kind of things government is currently investing in? So having an extra runway at Heathrow Airport, uh, you know, that may have made sense in the world before 2008 when you're projecting ever greater numbers of people flying. Uh, it started not to make much sense after 2008 because of the decline in prosperity. After the pandemic, with the collapse of airlines across the world and with, you know, we're already projecting in the UK anything up to 2 million unemployed, uh, that we lost 800,000 during the period that government was providing various support schemes. So once those are withdrawn, there's a much greater number of job losses to come. So in that climate, does it make sense to expand air travel? Probably not. 
uh, and then add in the sort of climate imperatives not to do such things as well. And there's a strong argument for saying, let's save the money on these kind of projects now and look at what else we might invest in instead. Now, the same goes, I would argue, for HS2. So the problem with that is it's already in the early building stages. So it's very difficult to persuade government to stop throwing good money after bad at that point, as they've already spent billions of pounds on preparing the ground for HS2. It would be seen as a big U-turn and a big reversal for government to pull the plug at this stage. But actually, it would make a lot of sense to do so. And not least because their thinking was that in some way, having a high-speed rail link to London would mean that sort of businesses were able to expand outwards along the sort of new rail corridor. What we're actually seeing is the sort of working from home environment that we, that probably surprised people at the beginning of the pandemic, where there were all kinds of questions about whether it was wise for people to work from home. It turned out for a lot of organizations, it was more productive. For the workers, it was a lot better because you didn't have that stressful sort of hour and a half in the car before you got to work. So the trend that plus the saving on rent on not having to rent an office is driving a lot of businesses to get rid of office space now and move to a virtual environment. So in that climate, does it still make sense to have high speed rail linking the country up? And again, probably not at the kind of, at that kind of cost that that's coming in at. I, I can um, see I can see that what, you, what you're saying there. Um, and indeed, High speed rail is is in the link, but what would you say to something like um, what what is in their program? Offshore wind. I wouldn't do much more of it in the UK. I, one of the nice things about the UK is because we're sat in the Northeast Atlantic, right underneath the Gulf Stream, we have a lot more wind than other people. That's not just what comes out of our politicians. Um, you know, so we can actually build wind turbines. That's fairly easy. The problem we now have is we've got such a penetration of wind power or wind capacity in our electricity mix that we're now getting days and weeks where when we get high pressure over the country and there isn't any wind, we're really struggling to keep the lights on. Uh, now we saw it, I think about three weeks ago. Uh, I, think I actually wrote an article about it called Guardian Slips because the Guardian, the UK newspaper has a habit of doing these happy clappy sort of stories about how the country ran entirely on renewables, was entirely coal free. Uh, what it almost never does is puts in the alternative article, which is this week, we've had to restart all the coal power stations because we didn't have enough wind. Now, the point is, you know, when we have days or weeks like that, when we don't have enough wind, it's not for want of extra wind turbines. Uh, you know, building extra turbines actually makes the problem worse as we come to rely on them far more. The problem is we lack any way of storing the electricity they generate. Well, so, in, this, in the program, they've, they've got um, hydrogen and, and the idea of blending hydrogen into the gas grid. So presumably that. Yes, but it, it, it's not altogether clear in that circumstance, are they talking about, because I think they're actually double counting. In a sense, they're talking about using hydrogen as a storage medium for excess electricity. But then they're also talking about the same hydrogen being used to replace natural gas. You can't have it both ways. I mean, either it's a replacement for national gas for natural gas, or it's a storage medium. Uh, I think you find this quite a bit in government documents, I and mean, not just the British ones. I mean, it's fairly common when it comes to green energy, where if you like the the renewable electricity that we're going to generate is both going to power the electricity grid and at the same time replace fossil fuels. And of course it can't do both, it's, it does one or the other. Uh, the same thing comes in with arguments about economic growth, that in some way at the same time that we're replacing out fossil fuels and providing storage mediums, it's also going to be growing the amount of energy we have. And again, it can't do all three. <laughs> so you have to choose. Uh, you know, I think wind turbines, I mean, we've actually got, um, there are days when wind is producing up to 60% of UK electricity. Uh, at that point, because we've lost the inertia of traditional electricity generation, we run risks of the kind of power outages that we had last August, where you get a sudden drop in the frequency of the electricity across the grid and they have to start shutting everything down. 
um, that becomes much more likely the more penetration you have of renewables. It's basically because they don't have the heavy metal turbines spinning around to keep the system going. Uh, so if you get a fluctuation in the output of a gas or a coal power station or a nuclear one, you still have these giant spinning turbines that are actually generating the electricity. So moment to moment fluctuations get ironed out by the inertia. Get the same sort of dropping out of the frequency on wind or solar and you lose the grid. <laughs> Uh, and what we saw last August was half of the country getting shut down for a couple of hours. Uh, I mean, including crucially the rail network at rush hour. Um, you know, I, those are serious issues that if you read the sort of grid engineering magazines, you know, the grid engineers are far less optimistic about this than the politicians, because uh, they're aware that actually this, the, you know, there's a lot more infrastructure needs putting into place than just putting turbines up. Uh, turbines, if you like, is the corporate profitability thing. Uh, you know, somebody gets paid a whacking great subsidy to put a turbine up, then they get preference on selling their electricity. So they get rich. But it's the national grid that somehow has to integrate that in. So that at this point, the better investments are on storage technologies and on energy saving. Uh, so you get more bang for your buck at this point if you're going to insulate people's houses than you will from adding wind turbines. Uh, although, again, that goes against the government's general view, that, you know, essentially that we shouldn't directly favor people with spending. Uh, but arguably, there is a good case for insulating properties. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the infrastructure implication of the words infrastructure are you're dealing with big projects. Big things are not dispersed. Um, investment across households and, um, and, uh, and buildings. And of course, your point about buildings when it comes to commercial property is also well met. You, there's going to be quite a lot of buildings which are probably going to be abandoned in the future. So one of the interesting things I noticed in their infrastructure project is that they plan to revitalize 100 town centers and high streets across the country. Well, when you look at today's uh, news or recent news in recent times of um, Debenhams, for example, and the Arcadia shopping um, conglomerate, you, you think, well, uh, good luck with that one then. Um, so what does it mean to uh, revitalize um, 100 town or city centers yeah I, one of the this was one of the issues with that is they've already done it once there's one of the big sort of shifts in usage for town and city centers around the uk in the last couple of decades has been the switch from a general city center that everybody came into and used to actually a much more student focused city center you often find they built these giant complex of student accommodation to get extra students coming into the universities uh, because a lot of the sort of shops and businesses that survive in that environment are the ones that aim at the student market. You know, so you have lots of nightclubs and bars that play music and, you know, I mean, kind of quite a vibrant thing if you're young and you're in that category. Uh, the problem they've now got, of course, is the student market itself is starting to collapse. Uh, I mean, in part, just because the up and coming generation is a hell of a lot smaller than the millennials. Uh, you know, so if you like, the capacity of the universities has been catering to a millennial generation that was almost as big as the boomers. So you had all of these buildings for student accommodation, the universities were all going to get rich out of them. Because the second market was overseas students coming in. I think both of those have been severely damaged by the pandemic. I mean, it, clearly there is going to be a rethinking of education when the dust settles. Um, you know, I mean, there will be questions about how much you need to actually travel to a university anymore. Could you do most of it online? Because that's what they're doing now. Uh, there'll be questions about you know, how far universities should be packing students into halls of residence like sardines just to fleece them for the rent. Um, I think there will probably, although whether government realizes it at this point, there is probably a need to rethink the kind of qualifications that people are taking in the first place. 
uh, you know, I mean, the problem has been that we've had this drive to get 50% of the uh, each age group into academic disciplines. It might be that going forward, we need far more sort of manual skills, craft skills, you know, a much wider set of skills. And that actually having lots of people that are doctors of philosophy or history or whatever isn't necessarily what the post-pandemic economy will need most. Which isn't to say that some of those people aren't a good idea. <laughs> Um, but not everybody can be. Um, now again, you know, if you like, part of the complication going into Herr Schwab's buddies is they have a very techno techno utopian alternative to what. Hang on, explain who Herr Schwab is. So Herr Schwab is the head of the World Economic Forum, who wrote a book about three or four years ago called "The Fourth Industrial Revolution." Uh, and that talks about this sort of computerized AI run world where everything is connected together. Uh, they talk about the internet of things where you, know, you will no longer go shopping. Your fridge will order whatever's missing from directly from Tesco's and a drone will fly in and sort of drop whatever you, your fridge has ordered on your doorstep. And you will get a message on your smartphone say your packet of hand cut chips has just arrived. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, won't that be great? Um, you know, so you, I, we see it with smart meters on electricity. I mean, this idea that the grid will be able to switch off your freezer for an hour in order to save electricity. Or, uh, and your benefit from that will be that you can sort of source the cheapest electricity from moment to moment off the grid to keep your bills low. And your car will be electricity and self-driving. You won't have a car. Uh, you will... The, the, sort of transport system will have sort of self-driving electric cars that when you need one, rather like Uber at the moment, you'll click something on your phone, uh, then you'll get a message you know, five minutes later that your car has arrived outside. Instead of getting in the driver's seat, you'll get in the back. Uh, I mean, you'll probably have a display screen where you can watch your favorite movie while you're being driven around. Uh, it's all, it sounds wonderful, but... <laughs> It is based on technologies that don't exist and energy sources that don't exist. Uh, I have to say, Tim, it doesn't sound wonderful to me because when I looked into this a year ago, um, there was a huge supplement in the Lancet, the medical hmm. journal, which was talking about the health effects of radio frequency electromagnetic <laughs> fields, which would be necessary to make um, all these uh, devices communicate with each other and um, the intensity of the, the electromagnetic fields were thought by a number of the doctors who were writing for this copy of this supplement of the Lancet to be a health risk. Um, and um, it, it also is a, a massive privacy uh, problem because in order to know everything you're doing and in order to um, target you for the purposes of selling, um, all these devices will be watching your activities and your consumption patterns and your day-to-day -day habits in minute detail. And you wouldn't have any privacy, but you would be continually badgered for um, consumer purposes and perhaps also um, for reasons because you, all the information about you will be plugged into a variety of other political or other surveillance services. So it didn't sound, to, I mean, although it's your, your article describes this as techno-utopian, I, I, when, I, when I looked into this, and there's a wonderful article by Shoshana, not article, a book by an author called Shoshana Zuboff on surveillance capitalism. And when I read that book, I thought this is no utopia. This is a fucking nightmare. So anyway, well, we have to move on. I think we we we've had our poke at uh, the World Economic Forum and and. The, and well, I mean, I mean, let's just say that I think Herr Schwab has never had to spend two hours on the phone to talk talk trying to get his broadband to work. Oh God, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, in the real world, yeah. I mean, the technologies are just not that advanced. I and mean, yeah, I take the point about the techno dystopian side of it, that it's very much like Huxley's Brave New World. Uh, there was always that sort of argument between people that thought we were going to end up in Orwell's 1984 with the oppressive 
you know, the jackboot standing on somebody's head, or whether we would get Huxley's Brave New World, where actually they corrupt us by the things that give us pleasure. Uh, I think a lot of the Herr Schwab sort of vision of this, uh, which he's since updated with this book, The Great Reset, which is this argument that we'll use the opportunity of the pandemic to build back this new fourth industrial revolution world. Uh, that a lot of that is meant to appeal to <laughs> yeah, this idea that yeah, leave it to us and we will keep you in comfort. Um, and it works essentially on the same principle as social media that you know, basically you don't have to pay for it and anything you don't pay for means that you are the customer. Uh, and in a social context, you know, that can lead into things like social credit scores, uh, where basically if you haven't behaved yourself according to the sort of rules that we've sort of set for society, then we're not going to let you access a bank account or the telephone network, or we're not going to let you travel anywhere. Uh, you know, so we have this, these abilities to control you without the need for armed police or jails. Because uh, actually, we can keep you on lockdown in your house the same as we do with the pandemic, except, you know, I mean, yes, you'll be allowed to leave your front door, but you won't be allowed to access any of the things that sort of provide you with life support. <laughs> uh, you know, and that vision of dystopia is built into this as well, whether intended or not. I mean, I'm sure Herr Schwab would say, no, 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 you know, that wasn't the intention at all. But I mean, clearly that technological infrastructure, if it were possible, would be able to be abused in that way. Uh, the saving grace is I don't think it's possible. I mean, I'm interested that the World Economic Forum's video that they put out about what they're calling the Great Reset, central to powering it was nuclear fusion. Uh, because nuclear fusion is a technology that was 25 years ahead of us when I was born. It still claimed to be 25 years ahead of us, and I dare say it will be 25 years ahead of us for centuries to come. Um, you know, so fortunately, there is no power source behind this. And without that, it cannot work. Yeah, there's, there's not just a power source, there's all the minerals mm. that will be necessary for this massive expansion of digital um, equipment, the, the cobalt, the nickel, the lithium, the copper, and all, all these things. Um, the, the various studies for example, by Simon Michaud of the Finnish uh, Geological Service. He's an e eco economic geologist. And he's, he's shown conclusively that you, the, the, the minerals will be depleted and run out a long time before such a, a techno dystopia could actually be brought into existence. Having said that, however, the uh, attempt to start this process can create a mess and send society off in the wrong direction. So if we don't want it to go on the rotten, wrong direction, what is the right direction, Tim? I'll pass that one to you. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think the direction broadly is towards localization and far more sort of craft-based skills. Uh, so if you like, the infrastructure that we built after or in the decades after the Second World War was about an oil-based infrastructure. So lots of motorways, lots of private motoring. We actually cut the rail, rail network to encourage people to use the new roads. Uh, uh, globalization takes it to its ultimate conclusion where you have you know, massive oil-powered ships bringing all of our goods around the world. Uh, and for things that you need rapidly, you get the air transport infrastructure to you know, so I can go down to the supermarket, or I could before the pandemic, go to the supermarket down the road at this time of year, so January, and buy chili and strawberries fresh from the fields. I'm sort of rather hoping that we can't do that, after the, you know, because it never was an ecologically sensible thing to do, but that was how globalization worked. Um, all of that depends upon a steady supply of cheap oil, and cheap being the important thing, you know, cheap in energy terms. Uh, you know, part of the problem with all of the resources is, if you like, critics will come back to us and say, yes, but there are you know, massive reserves of all of these minerals and all of the oil and fossil fuels. What are you talking about? The point is, how many of them are, in energy terms, accessible to us? Because you get to a point where you're using more energy to extract or to recover these minerals than they, if you like, than the benefits that they give you. 
Uh, uh, the example I give in one of my books was, I think I added up how much, how many of these minerals or how, what volumes of these minerals could be found in seawater. And theoretically, all of the minerals we need forever and ever could be extracted from seawater. The problem is that only four of them, it was iron, iron, sodium, manganese, and possibly copper, were the only ones that were in seawater that were worth extracting. All of the others cost too much to recover. Now, essentially, the same is true with deposits that are in the ground. That you know, if you like a hundred years ago, people were finding bloody great nuggets of pure metal. Like we pretty much used all of them up. So now we're grinding down ever, ever poorer qualities of ore. Um, so I think going back a decade ago, there was talk about copper ore running at about 0.2% of, of the ore. So you know, for each ton of ore, you got 0.2% of a ton of copper out at the end. Uh, you had to use massive amounts of energy to grind the rock down and then to heat it up to get the copper out. Uh, with copper, it's actually far, far more economical to recycle what we've already got. And there's enough of it out there that it makes sense. With things like rare earths and some of the rarer minerals that we use, there's not enough quantity there to make it viable to recycle it even. Um, you know, it costs you more to recycle than it's worth when you get it. Uh, so these are the problems that we're running into now. Now we had a similar problem back in the days of peak coal. So back before oil was used extensively, people even, even at the point where economies across Europe were actually struggling to keep the supply of coal up, people looked around the world and said, yes, but there are these huge deposits around the world. What are you on about? You know, we're not running out. Because the problem wasn't that they were running out. They'd run out of accessible coal. I think what we're looking at is that we are hitting this point where we're now running out of accessible materials. So there are things that we've already created that we can recycle. There are depleting deposits that we can still access, which means we'll still have these minerals. We're just going to have them in smaller quantities than we had before. And what nobody knows at this point is how rapidly that depletion is going to happen. So from there, if you if you take the two scenarios that we've talked about, this sort of brave new world of computerized internets of things depends upon all of those minerals being available in massively growing quantities, and they're not going to be there. So that isn't going to work. The government one, which is actually much more oil based, you know, we're going to run extra trains, we'll build a few extra motorways and some runways. That again, I mean, with a bit of greenwash on the top by putting up a few extra wind turbines in the North Sea, well, okay, fine. Uh, but that is very much about, oh, yeah, next year we will have more and cheaper oil than we had last year. So people will be able to fly. People will still be able to drive their cars on the new motorways. What I'm looking at is, no, 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 we need an infrastructure for a depleting mineral environment. Yeah, uh, and can I just butt in there the, the whole my understanding of the main drive of your article, because we've only talked about the beginning of it, is, is that we're, we're far closer to the way, to, to, to the actual crunch point on the energy source, particularly oil. Um, because what you're, you're saying is the lockdown has brought forward the, these, these depletion processes because they've made it even more um, economically unviable to actually extract oil um, and to to run a number of features of the economy which require uh, mass production mass markets and so on and the, the the economy particularly on oil for example is is likely next year well not not next year in a few months time to um, take a fall um, that's that's one of the issues in your article, isn't it? Oil and transport. Can you say a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, we're already seeing oil tankers being scrapped. Uh, I mean, if you can get a satellite image of Bangladesh, I mean, there are ships sort of washed up on the beaches there waiting because uh, Bangladesh has become a ship scrappage capital of the world. I mean, I guess because the labor is cheap. Um, yeah, so we've already seen oil tankers being beached and starting to be dismantled because the value of the steel in the tanker is now considered higher than 
the potential of sort of shipping oil around the world in the future. Uh, so we're already seeing that loss. And there was an article in Bloomberg last week talking about how the route from the Gulf to China, and China being one of the few places in the world that's actually making things, that the tankers were actually running at a loss taking oil to China at this point. Um, so there's actually a time window there is what they were talking about as well. I basically, in order to maintain their license to move oil, they have to keep working. So they can't just lay the ships up. So they have to keep operating them. So it's in their interest for a while to run at a loss. The problem is that, and they haven't said when, but there'll be a point where that window ends and you can no longer afford to run at a loss. And at that point, you have to scrap the ships uh, you know, or mothball them. And maybe you can bring them back into operation if things pick up. So that's kind of the transport side. I mean, it's not the only shipping. I mean, there's, uh, shipping is being scrapped on a massive scale around the world, uh, including uh, the more famous one in the media is all of the cruise ships because nobody has been able to go on cruises this year. Uh, so a vast amount of this cruise ship fleet has been written off. Uh, similar things with actually truck sales and truck write-offs are uh, truck sales are down by about 40% on the previous year. Uh, you know, plus, people are getting rid of old trucks at the same time, so that capacity is going down. Uh, similar with air, um, I mean, all of the 747s have gone now. The last of them got scrapped during the pandemic. Um, the air, you know, air companies are having to get rid of planes at this point. They can no longer just hang around waiting for government subsidies. So the transport side of it has been depleted quite, quite a lot. At the same time, again, I think economists seem to assume that oil wells are kind of almost like a tank full of oil that you just turn the tap and you can leave it till later. The geology doesn't work that way. That, I mean, yes, some of these wells will be reopened. A lot of them won't be worth reopening at all because there's it's basically the cost of reopening them against what you can recover is now sort of too close to break even. Um, and there will be other wells that simply never get restarted. Um, a particular problem with the American shale oil, which is basically all of the growth in oil over the last decade has come from the American shale patch. The problem with the shale wells is they deplete incredibly quickly. So you lose about 90% of your production within three years. Uh, that sets up what in that industry is called the Red Queen Syndrome, where you have to keep running just to stand still. So effectively, you have to keep drilling new wells to replace the wells that are depleting. And one of the things that hasn't happened through the pandem pandemic is we haven't been drilling new wells. Um, so that if we tried to open up tomorrow, we would face a 20% shortage of oil compared to the December 19, sorry, 2019. Uh, you know, basically because all of those drilling rigs either got scrapped or got laid up. Uh, so even if they used all of the drilling rigs that they now got idle and got them all working, you would still be looking at roughly a 20% shortage until that oil comes online, which isn't straight away. It takes about seven months. Um, so restart the economy now and we face oil shortages immediately. And those shortages are unlikely to be met for, let's say, six months. Um, you know, which suggests to me high levels of inflation as people try to outbid each other to get hold of the oil, uh, which again means further disruption. Um, so I think you know, those reasons, plus the sort of job losses we're already seeing, point to a quite depressed post-pandemic environment. The sort of less resources to go around, shortages where people are trying to get things up and running, and a large sort of stagnating trail of sort of lost employment and you know, people that used to have reasonable incomes that could buy things who are, are now living on state subsistence and can't. Yeah, I, I, I think that the, 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 the way of thinking about what happens when an economy contracts is not that it's a nice, smooth, gradient downwards falling by half a percent and then another half a percent and, and so on it's it's more like going down a bumpy path more like going down steps um, because 
when things are contracting, what happens is they don't just contract in a nice even way. They contract to a point where they stop altogether. They stop altogether because they go bust or, or they stop altogether because there's a, a, an economies of scale effect that is only possible to produce lots of goods um, in, in, a, in a production a manufacturing economy if they're done above a certain scale. And if you try and do the uh, production below that certain scale, it's simply not economic at all and you have to stop. Um, so instead of going shrinking smaller and smaller and smaller, what happens you shrink to a point and then something falls out of the system altogether. And if that thing that falls out of the system altogether is, I say, a component or an important uh, feature of the economy that has knock on effects, which stop other things happening too. you know, you can't, you know, if, if for example, the, the thing that goes bust is the, the, the subcontractor who builds the doors of a car, you can't go on producing the car without the doors. I'm just using that as an example. But so, so you, 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 you have all sorts of things simply stop altogether. And that's the nature of the a contractionary process. And it becomes um, particularly important, particularly um, difficult when the, some of the things which stop altogether have a, uh, a knock on effect, which is, uh, you know, fundamental for the, the, the entire functioning of the, of the economy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's becoming an issue uh, with sort of mid-range goods. Uh, I, I'm thinking of things like uh, tablet computers and things where if you go onto Amazon and you try to order these things and they'll be advertised on Amazon, but you'll very likely, if you try to buy them, get a message saying, sorry, it's out of stock. Now, that kind of out of stock is hitting up you know, ever more goods during the pandemic uh, for the very reason you're talking about, that there are components in the supply chain that have now been disrupted. And as a result, you know, all of the production that used to work on this just-in-time basis can no longer work just in time. So you have people putting in orders for things. You know, so yes, you know, we want you know, 300 of your computers, please. And you're you know, where it used to be that you know, that would be loaded onto the ship next day and you get it 30 days from now you're now going to have to wait for the next available ship or the next available container and they're in short supply. Uh, you know, so in a sense, the, the, it's more of a promissory economy that we'll get it there at some point, but we don't know when. Um, I think that isn't quite the same as, the, if you like, the bottom of that pyramid is the actual raw materials. And the assumption has always been up until now that if a raw material runs short, we will be able to find a substitute. A classic example being the oil shocks of the 1970s where American oil production had reached its peak. The price of oil went up. As a result, they were able to bring the North Alaskan slope, the Gulf of Mexico and the North Sea onto line. So the assumption had always been that, well, when that happens, there will always be a previously inaccessible deposit that we can bring online. Where we're, uh, this is the point with this kind of energy limit that we've gone past the point where the energy cost allows us to do that anymore. Uh, as I put crudely, if, if it costs you the equivalent of a barrel of oil to get another barrel of oil out of the ground, there's no point in doing it. Uh, it's not quite as simple as that because of the things that rely on the barrel of oil that comes out of the ground. Um, you know, so that government expects to get its tax from the oil. Uh, so if you like, you, you need more than one barrel to come out of the ground. You need maybe two, two or three to keep government going. And the banks that lent the oil company money in order to drill the hole in the first place expect a barrel of oil's worth of energy out as well. Uh, so you don't have to get all the way down to this one to one ratio. Somewhere around about five or six to one could be enough to collapse the system. Uh, well, the good news is that American shale oil at best is five to one. Canadian tar sands are about two and a half to one. And biofuels in North America and in Europe are negative. 
So in a sense, you, you need two barrels of biofuel to get one barrel of oil out of the ground. I think the only biofuel that they found is capable of providing a return is biofuel based on sugar grown roughly around the equator. Uh, there's enough umph in the sugar to actually provide you with enough energy. Um, you know, so essentially we are reaching this position where substitution no longer works. And again, it's rewrite the economics tech textbooks that we've had since the dawn of the industrial age, where we've always been able to substitute. Just butt in there and say that the reason that's not noticed is because, um, say, with, with with sugar energy and so on, is is because governments subsidise the, the 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 farmers, for example, who are producing the sugar or, or the sugar cane or or whatever is the crop that they is using for, for biofuels. And so because it works financially, nobody's noticing that it actually isn't working as an energy proposition. Um, but, and that doesn't, that sort of doesn't matter when you're in a, you've got an energy surplus situation. Um, but it sure as hell matters in the situation where the energy system as a whole is increasingly, um, or is, is, the, the net, the energy surplus is, is decreasing um, very rapidly. It matters, it matters a great deal because essentially what you're doing is you're throwing energy away when, when, when that sort of situation arises. Okay, but where is this leading us uh, apart from to perdition? You know, I mean, what kind of, I mean, we, you, you began to talk about that earlier, about what kind of economic strategy is appropriate for this. The sort of things that I think are appropriate for this is to recognise where we're going, and um, one of the one of the industries which is particularly vulnerable to energy shortages is agriculture. Um, is is vulnerable because a lot of farm machinery runs on um, petroleum or diesel, more more particularly, um, because the transport of of food. The refrigeration of food runs on energy. The cooking of food runs on energy. It's a very energy intensive uh, stuff. So it's in not it's a, it's a vulnerable sector. And um, if we're going to transition to a, a society where energy is is no longer cheap, um, this the energy the food system is going to have to be reorganised. Um, much closer to home and on an organic basis. That's a massive transition. And it's something which cities and population centers are going to have to get to grips with because there's gonna come a point where the supermarket economy, which is based on the energy intensive agribusiness um, is going to fail us. And that isn't too far in the future. So that's one area where I think that infrastructure and job creation needs to, to start in cultivation, in um, bio, biomass as an energy source, but through the old fashioned way of coppicing and pollarding trees so that you don't take their roots out of the ground. And all sorts of um, things, uh, strategies for economic relationships, which used to prevail um, in, in decades and centuries past need to be rethought for current circumstances. Um, and and what, what, what how would you wind this up tim because i think we we we've mainly got the uh we've mainly got the message that you had in your um in your article yeah i mean i think with agriculture we may uh, it's ironic that the british government is moving away from food subsidies towards more environmental or what they see as environmental so it'll probably turn out that if you're a Tory donor and you grow a load of biofuel trees to be burnt in the Drax power station, they'll pay you. Um, you know, but there is a, a strong argument for the kind of common agricultural policy of the 1970s, where we subsidize farmers to make sure they keep growing the food. Uh, I, not least because we won't in future be able to depend on global supply chains. Uh, you know, so the more of your food you can grow locally, the better. And that might mean re, if you're like rebuilding some of the infrastructure that we got rid of during the last 30 or 40 years. Um, you know, so bringing dairies 
closer to home, um, reopening local marketplaces. Um, yeah, I mean, even the slaughterhouses for those that eat meat, um, you know, they've been centralized in such a way that it really doesn't benefit small, small farming. You know, so it might be even there that you reopen local or regional slaughter. Um, you know, so that's one side of it. I think there is a big market to be opened in recycling. Uh, now, at the moment, we have recycling centers, but they're essentially downcycling centers, uh, where a lot of the waste that's being processed in the end is probably better being burned. Um, you know, and although that's not great for the environment, it's probably the least worst for the environment. Because uh, what we had been doing up until recently was putting it all in containers, sending it to China, and the Chinese burnt it on our behalf. Uh, you know, so basically that way of doing things makes us look nice because we can all say, oh, I recycle all of my stuff. Yeah. But if it gets burnt at the end of a what, couple of thousand mile journey, then you've just added the sort of diesel fumes from the ships taking your waste to China to be burned. So if you're going to do it, perhaps burning it at home might be better than, and particularly with plastics, which are fossil fuel derived anyway. Um, so, okay, there's that kind of recycling. I'm thinking much more of things like metal recycling, mineral recycling. Uh, so setting up local or regional plants for doing that and developing the skills involved in it, because uh, we're likely to be moving to a much more manual economy. Um, because one of the things that will happen on the way down, as it were, as industrial society unwinds, is there's going to be a hell of a lot of the stuff that we've already built that's just sitting around needing to be recycled and repurposed. So as just one example, I mean, look at the car fleet that we have, where we went from a period when I was a kid in the 1970s, it was rare for people to have cars. I mean, most people used public transport and most people worked roughly within a couple of miles of where they lived. So that you know, the number of cars that you see, if you look at photographs of the period, I mean, it is rare to see lots of cars on the road. You see one or two. By the time I'd left school, you were starting to get to the point where every family had a car. And then very quickly after in the 1980s, then probably as a product of North Sea oil, you suddenly got to the point where you had two car families. And it kind of... Uh, you know, so now you have cars lining the streets because people have nowhere to park them even, but we developed this sort of commuting way of living that requires that more people have cars than we you know, would be ideal. And certainly more have cars than there's going to be fuel for in the very near future. Uh, you know, so there, there are huge chunks of metal and electronics and you know, all of the stuff that go into making a car that have to be disposed of at some point. I and mean, there will come a time. Uh, and again, one of the things perhaps foolishly we've been doing is sending all of that scrap to China. Uh, and all of the stuff they can't use gets burnt or dumped into the sea and you know, they repurpose the metal. It might be that we are going to need that to do that closer to home in future. So again, if you are looking at not just you know, sort of having the machine that crushes and compacts the car into a cube, but a genuine, how do we repurpose and how do we reuse this? Then you need a different sort of vision of what a recycling center looks like. And that becomes more and more important as global supply chains break down and things that we took for granted that we could get, start to get into short supply. Um, yeah, yeah, so there is another infrastructure. You have to make things with the idea that they're going to be taken apart and reused in some way. Yeah, that's more difficult to do. I mean, it becomes possible if you start doing it from the future, that the, the supply chains we have now assume that things are going to be thrown away at the end. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, there is no way. Um, well, that's, that's like your point. I think you made it some time ago where you say we, were, we want things for durability. We want to... Um, we want to produce things on a craft basis on the assumption that it will be possible to uh, repair them and that they will last. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of the, you know, the way capitalism has worked is this idea of built-in obsolescence. Uh, the famous example was the old light bulbs where they had a cartel that insisted that you only got a thousand hours out of a light bulb and then it had to break. 
Uh, so they've sort of built in that it would break before it got to that point, just to keep us buying lifelines. But you know, capitalism as a whole is sort of designed around, you, know, you buy something this year and by next year it's out of fashion or it's stopped working and you've got to go and buy another one. Um, and yes, that's only sustainable if you have a growing energy supply and a growing amount of resources to build it. Now we're in a position of constrained resources. We have to look at how do we conserve so that, if, as you said, we build things either so that they last for a long time, or if you can't do that, you make them recycled. Uh, you know, so whatever the piece of equipment is, if it breaks, it's easy to replace whatever's broken and you keep using it. Uh, you know, that isn't the way capitalism has developed over the last 40 or so years. Yeah, um, you could make a, a condition of selling anything that when it, when it breaks, you take it back. <laughs> or, you know, when, when you, you, you take back products, basically. Um, I couldn't do it for every product, obviously things which rot or so on, but you could do it for a lot. Yeah, I mean, there's the circular economy argument with something like a washing machine, where uh, they were pointing out that the, the, if you like the incentives around a washing machine now, where you buy the washing machine, the incentives are that at some point something breaks within the machine so that they can sell you a new one. You know, nobody is going to make money out of a sort of infinite lasting washing machine. But their idea was, well, what if instead of buying the washing machine, you rented it on a per wash basis? So essentially, they would come and install the washing machine in your kitchen or in your garage. And they would guarantee you for your money, they would, it will run 100 washes. And then after 100 washes, you pay for your next one. That would give them an incentive to make sure that the machine works for as long as possible. Because the longer they can run it without having to repair it, the more they make. Uh, you, know, you yourself would end up paying no more over the lifetime of it because you know, eventually you'd have ended up having to buy a new one anyway. Uh, so that might apply to a lot of sort of the, the bigger appliances. Uh, so that we move, I, mean, almost, I remember renting televisions when we were kids. The you know, television technology was still a bit iffy. <laughs> So they, they, you know, people were a bit reluctant to buy televisions. So in order to get the television industry going, they used to rent you the TV. And you know, sort of quite frequently, I think, televisions used to break down so you'd get the TV repairman to come out. Uh, so we could go back to that kind of setup as an incentive for the people that make these things to keep them going. Um, yeah, and I, all, all these kind of um, innovations in... In uh, institutional arrangements, I think have to be have to be worked on from now on. Well, of course, government itself becomes a you know, something that needs to be repurposed. Uh, if you like, the nation state itself is a product of the oil age. Uh, so, if you go back to the years before the First World War, local government was far more powerful in relation to central government. It was only the needs to the need to fight a total war during the First World War that saw that balance shift away from the local to the national. And it may well be that we need to see that kind of relocalization of government as well. Um, you know, so it's going back to the idea that central government has a limited role to play. Uh, I mean, in setting national laws by all means, but also things like defense. Um, is that actually, if you like, the number of things that central government now does where it seems to interfere with just about everything, that a lot of that isn't going to be possible in an energy-constrained future. Therefore, you need to look at what a central government needs to do and then think about how to reorganise at a local level. Uh, and I mean, you know, given the discussions we've had with Nottingham Council and to an extent with Cardiff, you know, the local council infrastructure that we have at the moment isn't fit for that purpose. So in a sense, the local councils that we have are a product of the centralization of the national government. So they're not designed to run everything at a local level. They're designed basically to be parasitical. Uh, so you have lots of very highly paid people running something that wouldn't be viable in, in and of itself. And they require huge subsidies from the center to keep going. 
but they're not actually capable of running a local infrastructure or a local legal system or local bylaws. You know, none of that is within their, their ability at this point. So again, you're seeing government almost in itself as a kind of technology, that there are different forms of government. And we need to think basically that if the national level, certainly the international bodies like the WHO, United Nations will be greatly weakened after the pandemic. Uh, so if you like, as supply chains fall in and become relocalized, the ability to have, maintain things at the international level becomes harder. Um, you know, and as the national government shrinks, so more and more has to be done at the, at the local level. So you have to then think through, well, if you like, what is the ideal role of government at each of these levels and what should and what shouldn't it be doing? That is a big topic, and I don't think we can solve it in this particular discussion. But let's come, let's come back to that in a, in a future uh, discussion.